Thank you very much for inviting me to talk here. Uh, it is a great honor. Um, I'm speaking from St. Petersburg in Russia, uh, which my country is a country which has a lot of forests that we believe are drastically underappreciated in the climate change narrative. So I will try to tell you a story of why forests are very important. <clears throat> and probably this will provide um, maybe an unexpected perspective on how we view the climate change and the strategic and tactical solutions to mitigation to the mitigation problem. So <clears throat> uh, what is, uh, I will base my talk on the notion of climate sensitivity and climate sensitivity is just how we expect, by how many degree we expect the planet to warm if CO2 doubles. So it is a measure of uh, response of the planet to CO2 increase. And now there is a problem in climate change science, which can be summarized as follows. Climate models that uh, describe the present well, the cloud cover and everything, have a significantly higher climate sensitivity than models that describe the past well. So it seems that so there is this problem and how this could be. And I will give you an idea of what the climate sensitivity is. Actually, it can be described as having three legs. This is a three legs narrative is inspired by Rob Lewis story on Milan Milan's uh, narrative of climate change. First having two sides, two legs, like land use and CO2, and now becoming one leg more focused on CO2. So inspired by this vision, I will offer you like a brief uh, view of the three legs of climate sensitivity. So you can see, imagine our atmosphere. So this is height. So this is like our atmosphere and this is temperature. So we know this graph on the right shows how the te actual temperature declines with height. Okay. And there is our planet receives energy from the sun. And definitely it also emits as almost as much as it receives with a very high precision. Otherwise, we would be warming much faster than we do now. And so there is a lay in the atmosphere where those molecules sit that emit thermal radiation directly to space. This is the upper radiating layer, and it is about five kilometers. And then there is equilibrium temperature, the second leg, which determines how much the planet must emit to keep the balance. And then we know that there is a vertical temperature gradient, which actually is a measure of the greenhouse effect, and we know that our temperature is much higher than the equilibrium. It is about like 290 K. So what determines these three legs? The upper radiating layer is determined by the CO2 amount. I, I just tell you that you will play with all this as I will make my slides available. This is really a good way to understand how the climate change narrative is quantitatively like based. So there is the the uh, the equilibrium temperature is de determined by albedo and the vertical gradient of uh, temperature may be determined by natural forest as I argue. So what happens when we increase CO2? Then these molecules that emit directly to space, when we increase CO2, they find themselves higher in the atmosphere, okay? So we had about five. This is like not exact figures. Now, for example, we have six, but the, the temperature there is lower. And so to match the incoming energy, 
we must have warming. So the surface must warm. And this is, you see, these lines are parallel. This goes up. This is the essence of CO2 related warming as it is currently incorporated in climate models. Then we can decrease albedo, which means that the Earth will absorb more energy. Albedo actually uh, determines how much the Earth reflects uh, solar radiation back to space. Okay, so if we decrease it, uh, for example, making the Earth darker, then the um, even if we don't change the CO2, so you can see this gray line remains where it was, still we will see warming again, because the planet will need to warm at the surface to ref uh, to like to emit more energy, and so CO two increase and they'll bear the decrease or increase is something that I bet everybody has heard about. And here already, when we talk about albedo, we already see that forests can play a very significant role, and they have highly recommend this study of Alison Pocorn and Wild just out in Global Change Biology, who basically uh, put forward the idea that no matter how climate models are struggling with reproducing the cloud cover, just reasonable expectations would be that the more forests we have, the more evapotranspiration, the more condensation and the more cloud formation and clouds reflect sunlight and so the planet cools. So with more forests, as the authors argue, this um, uh, blue line, vertical blue line, would move to the left and we would see cooling, okay? So these are these two legs. CO2 increase leading to warming, albedo decrease leading to warming also. But the third leg is the most mysterious one. It is the vertical temperature gradient. You can see that if we change the slope of this line, how fast does the temperature decline with height? We can have warming at constant concentrations of CO2 and constant albedo. Nothing changes, just the temperature gradient, but we have warming. And so we argued in this study with colleagues uh, recently that basically forests are absolutely crucial for the determination of this lapse rate. Why? Because when forests transpire um, um, water, uh, they capture a certain part of solar energy as latent heat, and then this latent heat goes from the surface up to the upper layers of the atmosphere, where it is released, and this smooths the vertical temperature gradient. Upon deforestation, this upward transport of heat and heat discontinues, and the vertical temperature gradient becomes sharper, as you can see in this picture. And actually, we showed that indeed climate models consistently underestimate changes in the vertical temperature gradient. You can see that study, but basically these dashed lines are models and these uh, colored things are observations. So you can see there is no match and especially no match over land. So, and this can be related, I return to my first slide, to the increasing climate sensitivity. So why do models that describe the present well have a high sensitivity? Because the sensitivity might have been increasing, reflecting the decline in natural forests and other natural ecosystems. And you can see that primary forests and non-forest ecosystem experienced a dramatically decline, like about 30 percent, 
over the same period that CO2 increased by the same 40-50%, okay? So, and why should we expect that this um, should impact climate sensitivity? We do know since the pioneering study of Vladimir Vernatsky that ecosystems do have a major climatic impact. They are major players recycling all substances that matter for our environment, okay? Water and carbon and everything else. But what is the nature of this impact? Is it chaotic, just, you know, one day one thing, another? No. It is very natural that natural ecosystems have evolved a stabilizing impact on their own environment. Ecosystems exist for dozens of millions of years, and if they were destabilizing their own environment, that wouldn't be able to exist for so long. Hence, their loss and replacement by our arbitrary uh, collections of species should increase climate sensitivity and lead to greater climate destabilization. And conversely, preserving natural climate regulating forests, and don't believe anybody who will tell you that they don't exist, that the forests are dying, they are not. They are only being killed when we log and burn them. If we leave them as they are, they will probably outlay us also. So, I'm my last, what to do? Simply stopping the ongoing destruction of the remaining global wilderness, including currently self-recovering ecosystems, like the proforestation concept, can slow down climate destabilization. And, and as our analysis of the vertical temperature gradient shows, the impact can be very substantial and international protection of these ecosystems and ambitious investigations to understand them are absolutely key for preserving human identity, what we are worth as a species and as a highly developed ethically and intellectually competent society. So to stabilize climate, we call for a global moratorium on logging in natural climate regulating forests. And we are proud that our call was recently supported by many American scientists who wrote in a letter for to President Biden also requesting this old moratorium on logging old growth forests. It is really urgent and efficient measure to prevent the worst from happening. Thank you very much.